live. So here we are, Dr. John Thomas and myself. We're going to be talking to you guys today about histamine intolerance, gluten sensitivity, and what that has to do with your genetic type. John, thanks for getting on the call today here. No problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yes, well, not having you. I mean, yeah, thanks sure. for giving me your time. Right? Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, you know, I thought this was a good topic because so many people that you and I see out there are confused, right? I mean, they don't know if they should be on a low histamine diet. Um, the word oxalates have come into their um, into their brain to understand there's some kind of oxalate component. But then there's, of course, the gluten-free stuff, um, the grain-free, the autoimmune diet. So, how do we make sense of this, especially if someone is exhausted and tired and they're really left with nothing to eat, but at the end of the day, they don't know what to believe now. They heard this is the best way to go and then they hear contradicting information about, you know, this is the best way to go and then they have two different ways that they can go and they don't really know where to go. So how do you, how do you unravel mystery for people? Yeah, so I, I think if somebody's actually to the point where they have heard of a lower histamine diet or a low oxalate diet they're they're probably ahead of the game you know um i think where the bigger problem lies is the people that have no idea that that is a possible lifestyle component that they have to follow and what's great is um our genetics can lead us down rabbit holes in terms of what we possibly need to consider from a dietary lifestyle side of things and the problem lies is is you know, we go into a, you know, our doctor because we've got a bunch of complaints. We go to see a functional doctor and they tell us we have leaky guts or we have gluten sensitivity and they put us on a, a paleo diet or an anti-inflammatory diet. And we just notice that there's still pieces that are missing. You know, the gut's not healing. We're not feeling better. Or somebody's following the craze where maybe they're doing like a ketogenic diet. And I hear this all the time where somebody comes to my office. And they're like, all my friends did fabulous on ketogenic diet. Like they lost weight, they feel better. And it's like, I gained weight and I feel worse. Um, and, and there's missing pieces of the puzzle. And, and what's great is our genetics can give us insight into what dietary component that may be best for that specific person. And so where the, the histamine component plays in is um, from a genetic perspective, histamine intolerance, um, you know, mass cell activation, this whole genetic component that deals with how our body and how our biochemistry can tolerate our environment, it can tolerate the histamine burden that happens due to just, you know, the things we're exposed to can be a big, big factor and a, and a big, big missing piece into why somebody's not recovering. And we're talking about genetics. Um, there, there's very, very few home runs in this. And the histamine story is probably one of the biggest things that I've seen that when we determine that that is a problem with someone and we put them on a low histamine diet and we supplement them properly to help break down histamine in the gut or break down histamine systemically, that has been the biggest game changer that I've seen, the biggest home run where somebody can really get their life back in a matter of weeks if that is a piece of the puzzle. And so we're talking about your genetic type um, and how people fall into certain class classifications where they have a little bit more of a genetic predisposition or weakness. One of the biggest components of this and, and one of the first genetic types that we kind of are really going to unravel here is actually the histamine genetic type. And, and that could be something that if somebody has problems with the inability to break down histamine in the gut or the inability to break down histamine at a cellular level, or they have a weakness in their mast cells and their body's just in this panic mode and is just dumping copious amounts of histamine into the system all the time and they can't control that, those are the people that I see that anything and everything they do, there's gonna, there's gonna be limitations. It's just because their histamine bucket of water is just flowing over the edge onto the floor, making a mess, and they just can't get one foot in front of the other. They can't get that needle kind of going in the right direction or really have a, a, a significant impact in their recovery process. And so the problem is, is we're told to follow like a paleo diet or we follow the craze of a ketogenic diet. And that could be completely wrong based on one's genetic type or genetic predisposition. Yeah. And so, so like you said, first and foremost, if they've heard the word histamine, 
and that's on their on their radar, then they're ahead of the game. And then the second thing you just brought up, which was pretty interesting, where people that do have it on their radar, they know about the DAO enzyme. Um, but you and I, I think, have might have made this mistake early on in the game when you look at the genetic component and you go straight to DAO. And you just mentioned there's two kinds of or more than two kinds of um, clearing out histamines in the body and where it's effective at clearing it out. So maybe sort of give us some insights on that where, OK, what what is this thing such as a histamine type? And how does it impact my ability to eat certain foods? And how do I know genetically which you know histamines are where the histamines I'm good at clearing that out? What does all that mean? Yeah. So when we're talking about histamine, you know, histamine is kind of one of those necessary evils in the body. You know, we need it for a reason. You know, so when we have some type of trauma or injury or stressor, we want histamine to release because what that does is it causes our immune system to kind of go fight the fight. It causes white blood cells to get to that area to create a, an immunological response to actually facilitate a healing process. Um, but the problem lies is people have a slow ability that when that process happens, when their body dumps histamine, that they break it down very slowly. And this can happen in different areas of the body. As we're talking about first and foremost is the gut. And really we can kind of classify this um, into kind of three aspects. You're talking about gut histamine, you're talking about histamines outside the gut and in our cells, and then you're talking about another component that deals with the immune system, which kind of deals with the storage mechanism of histamine, which are kind of what our mast cells do. I probably won't get into too much of that because that's a little bit more complex, but we kind of will just maybe if we have time touch on that. But the first component of that is the gut histamine story. You mentioned that, you know, people hear about this DAO enzyme and, and what happens is some people have a strong genetic weakness or they cannot make enough of those DAO enzymes. And so it's just like, hey, people will take digestive enzymes to help break down their fats, proteins, or carbohydrates. Some people need a supplement with DAO enzymes because genetically they cannot just make they cannot make enough to break down the amount of histamine that comes into the gut from the food that we eat. Okay. And one problem lies is people who are DAO and they go to their genetic report and they look at DAO. But that's not the right gene to look at. That DAO enzyme that's actually listed as DAO has nothing to do with the gut histamine. So you want to look at a gene that's called the ABP1, okay? And that ABP1 gene codes for the body's ability to make uh, diamine oxidase, which is that enzyme in the gut that breaks down the histamine, okay? And so if somebody's got mutations, they're, they're on these reports, they've got, you know, uh, you know, one or two mutated copies, or they're looking at other reports out there that they, they're color-coded with yellow or red, and they've got genetic weakness in these ABP1 genes, they most likely have a decreased ability to make enough of those DAO enzymes. This is something you can measure through a lab as well. So, hey, if you have the genetic component, you can go down the rabbit hole of measuring it, and if that indicates that you have a weakness, that is a starting point because you have to make a lifestyle change. You have to figure out, okay, dietary-wise, I've got to decrease the amount of histamine coming into my into my body because I don't just have enough of those enzymes to break it down. And then plus, you probably also need to supplement with those enzymes we all have a better control of the histamine burning. Because if you don't control that, it can lead to a laundry list of symptoms like fatigue, digestive issues, skin issues, neurological complaints, listen to on and on and on. But then what happens is some of that histamine then is going to get absorbed across the gut into our body. And then that in turn is going to increase our histamine burden in our body. If you've got a genetic component there, that just kind of is another piece of the puzzle. And so we're talking about genetic types of histamine People have, as a starting point with that gut story, they have issues with those ABP1 genes that they just can, cannot control the amount of histamine that's coming in um, from a dietary side of things. When we talk about the diets we listed out there that are non-histamine diets, we're talking about ketogenic, high histamine, paleo, higher high histamine, okay? You talk about anti-inflammatory, you know, it could be moderate to high histamine just based on the food sources that we're eating. So the things that we're told that are, beneficial and, and some of these foods that are high histamine are very very healthy based foods and it doesn't mean that they're not healthy it just means that for you for your genetic type it's adding more fuel to the fire because your body has a issue with control of the histamine burden it doesn't mean you can never come back to eating that it just means that you got to get control of histamine first and then you're able to loosen the reins and add some of those things back into the mix all right so that's the first component we're talking about this like kind of three-tiered issue with people that have a um, genetic type of a uh, of a weakened histamine breakdown state 
is the gut side of things. Um, and, and then we can talk a little bit more into the kind of systemic or cellular breakdown um, if there's anything you want to add to that. No, just to summarize. So, you know, people will go on a gluten-free, autoimmune, paleo, um, even ketogenic-based diet, and, and they've done gut testing, they've done leaky gut testing, they've done food sensitivity testing, and lo and behold, they, they never seem to fix it. And ultimately, if they have these genetic components that they have may have falsely uh, array, eliminated and say, I don't have it because they only looked at the DAO component and they actually didn't look at ABP1 um, and they are not able to effectively make enzymes that clear out the extra histamines in the GI tract and or they have environmental factors or they have immune burdens or stressors or even alcohol that's going to make the histamine burden even higher going gluten-free is kind of like cutting their nose off to spite their face if they're not going and, and addressing the main, you know, part of the problem, which is their inability to clear out histamines. And I, and I find a lot too, John, I'll talk to people that have really bad predispositions for ABP1, and they're not the ones that typically say, yeah, I do really terrible with allergies and wheeziness and um, itchiness and, um, you know, I don't really have any problems with pets or, or things like that. And, and what I explained to them in that context is that's not where the weak link of the chain is breaking necessarily. I mean, that's kind of where it's being originating, um, but it's not necessarily where the weak link of the chain is. So maybe explain that to, to people too, is like, well, why would I not have those major things if it's a major genetic component? Yeah, and that's always a misconception with histamine because we always think histamine, you know, we always think like allergies. And if you don't have allergies like the, you know, the sinus issues, the red eyes, the, the issues with pollen or danders or pets, that you don't have a histamine problem. But the body, the body's response to histamine is a little different. We know that in the medical research that people um, can have histamine issues and it can be a, a trigger for PCOS, you know, because histamine can affect uterine function. And, and so to really kind of classify histamine and allergies is, is a real injustice because people's bodies are different. So somebody could have a gut histamine issue, but be phenomenal at breaking down histamine outside the gut. And they can have all these symptoms of fatigue and leaky gut issues, things of that nature. And that be a, a histamine issue in the gut driving those symptoms. But then when the histamine gets inside the body, now maybe they can break it down fast enough where maybe those allergy-based responses never manifest, okay? And so to really kind of classify histamine and allergies, and it's like, okay, if, if those two things aren't together, then there's no histamine problem. That's not the case at all, because I see the same thing with you. It's like people have a very weakened genetic predisposition with those ABP1 genes, and we test their, their uh, DAO levels and their histamine levels. And it's like those markers are abnormal, but they don't have sinus. They don't have allergy responses, but they have a laundry list of other symptoms like chronic pain, chronic fatigue, headaches, you know, the list can go on and on and on. And you control the histamine and they get better, you know? So um, we, we kind of got to get through that kind of, uh, you know, mindset that there's a, a, a connection there. And then you also mentioned the, the you know, two components with that, um, you know, going gluten-free, you know, gluten's high in histamine. So, you know, if somebody's on a low histamine diet, they got to do that. But the problem is, is they go paleo, they're, they, they eliminate gluten, but then they're eating all these other foods that are high in histamine and they're really not getting anywhere with it. Now, the big player with this, with this whole gut histamine component that leads to some of these other things, these other symptoms like pain, fatigue, uh, a higher predisposition to autoimmune issues, things of that nature, it kind of all does, it falls back to barrier system compromise or what we call leaky gut, because we know that there is a, a pretty strong correlation between histamine and zonulin. And zonulin is a protein in the gut that opens up the doorways of the, of the gut that allows things to cross from the gut to the bloodstream. And so we know that if our Zonium levels are high, okay? Or if our histamine levels are high, what's gonna happen is our, our zonium levels are gonna stay high. And so then what happens is our gut's gonna stay leaky 24 seven if you can't control the histamine burden. And I've, you know, I, I've, I've, I've consulted for labs. Um, one of the labs I've consulted for um, has a really, really good leaky gut test. So I've looked at hundreds of thousands of these leaky gut panels and we, kind of scratch our head years ago. It was like, why are people's guts not healing when they're doing these things? They're doing the nutrients like colostrum, glutamine. They're on a paleo-based diet. They're gluten-free and dairy-free and everything else. And it's like their gut's not healing. Um, 
their zonium levels are continuing to stay elevated, it's like, what's the missing piece? And then we started making a correlation, looking at genetics from what I do is like, wow, a lot of these people, especially people I see in my practice, that their guts were not healing. All these people had issues with those ABP1 genes. And then we get in and we test DAO levels and we test zonium levels. And, and it's like, all right, there's a correlation between low DAO and high zonulin. And now you put them on a low histamine diet and you start supplementing with those DAO enzymes and now the gut can heal. So, you know, and, and if people have been following us for, on some of these topics, you know, they've heard me probably, you know, uh, you know, talk about the number one reason why somebody's gut does not heal or why your leaky gut does not heal is due to this histamine story. Because if you cannot control histamine in the gut, your zonulin proteins are going to stay high and that gut's going to stay leaky all the time and you're never going to recover. Yeah, I mean, listen to this over and over again because I, I really feel this is information people aren't getting. So to summarize, they, I mean, they would want to start with some form of genetic testing um, to, to identify those. And we really haven't talked about MTHFR, although there is a extracellular component to um, MTHFR and an intracellular component. But anyways, as far as um, they would also, you mentioned um, they can test for DAO, they can test for zonulin, they can test for histamine. Um, what is the test that you typically recommend for that? So there's, there's different tests that test those components, but um, a lab called Dunwoody Labs, um, they have a panel that is their advanced leaky gut or advanced intestinal permeability panel that tests all those. It, it tests zonulin, it tests histamine, it tests DAO levels. And to me, it's, it's a, it's a no brainer if somebody has symptoms of histamine issues, or if you have genetic testing done, or you get genetic testing done, and you have a lot of issues in these histamine components, and you fall into what we call a histamine genetic type, that's probably something you want to look at. Because the thing is, is you could be missing the boat, you could say, all right, hey, I've got this ABP1 gene, I'm going to take one or two of these enzymes before each meal, and you test your DAO levels that are non-existent, I'm telling you this, one or two of those enzymes with, a, with meals out of the gate is probably not going to make a dent. You know, you got to push the gas pedal down initially for maybe a, a, a month or so uh, to really kind of restore function back, and then you can start loosening the reins on that because you've just depleted those levels over the years and over the decades that you're not going to make a dent. And then that's sometimes the, the issue where, hey, somebody says, that's not the problem because... You know, I took those supplements and it really had no impact. It's just, no, you just weren't doing it aggressive enough because you had no gas in the tank, okay? Um, so that, that Dunwoody test, to me, with people that have these AB, ABP1 gene variants it is a no-brainer. It's something that can really, really um, connect the dots and really determine how aggressive you have to go from a supplementation standpoint, how strict you got to be based on, um, you know, that low histamine diet, as well as how damaged your gut is, you know, and how high those zonia levels are to tell you, okay, you've got leaky gut if you did something you don't know already. Um, and, and then, you know, and then if you're genetically predisposed and you fall into the histamine type, realize that's a strategy that's life changing because this is something you've got to figure out and how do you got to make a lifestyle change and control the rest of your life? Because if you've got genetic weakness here, and you fix your gut and you get your DAO levels back up with supplementation, you're feeling better. And all of a sudden you stop that and you start eating high histamine again. You stop taking those supplements. Guess what's going to happen? You're genetically predisposed. You're going to start going backwards. Okay. But the thing is, is this is information. And when people find this out, they have a tool now and a resource that, Hey, they can, you know, keep things going in the right direction and just kind of get strict, loosen the reins, get strict, loosen the reins based on how they're feeling and function one day to the next going forward and control this the rest of their life. Okay. Yeah. And it gives a lot of power too, John, when they actually do something and have a specific change for the better or worse by doing less or more than knowing, okay, I'm actually impacting it based on what I'm doing versus I have no idea what's doing this. But there's a couple other things that were really important, which with what you said is, the importance of testing, because some people don't have the ability to test. And I've worked with people in that case, and we've assumed guilty until proven otherwise. And the problem with that is, is you are missing out on the idea of, okay, I do have the genetic type. I am uh, susceptible with these genes. Um, I will take the DAO enzyme, but because it's non-existent, I haven't taken enough. And you, you know, if you're not directly dialed into the amount or the dosing strategies that you need, then you are going to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, okay, it didn't work. Um, and you didn't know specifically enough. And the good news is you can also track with a before and after test to see yeah. those improvements. But 
The question I wanted to ask you, which we, we've seen happen a lot too, is let's say when we look at a, a genetic pyramid and we look at the priorities at the bottom of the pyramid and histamine, as um, you've said in, in, in your pyramid, is, is a higher priority than a lot of other people give it credit for because it's so, it's so dominant and so um, highly prevalent with the environment that we live in and the susceptibilities that we see. But let's say what happens is you start to address those um, histamine burdens, um, you start to reduce the inflammation in the gut and you repair a lot of that leakiness and you see some improvements, but now you may have some, what people call like detox reactions um, because now all of a sudden they potentially have all these extra methyl groups that they weren't necessarily um, having available prior to the histamine burden and, and the deficiency of their ability to methylate beyond that. So what, it's a sort of a high level question, but what happens for those people that may have t t done a histamine protocol, feel better, but now they get really anxious or they feel like they don't have like something, like they pop a leak somewhere else. Um, what's going on there? And maybe kind of explain sort of in another way of what I'm trying to ask yeah. you with you know, what's going on. So kind of like, you know, to kind of give a little bit of a, 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 a preface to that a little bit in terms of the you know, methyl group component things that actually kind of gets into the second part of this where you're talking about at the cellular level okay and and histamine breakdown once histamine is outside the gut all right or based on our our body's response to stressors and how our body produces histamine at the cellular level um and then more importantly how our body breaks that down and people have a lot of histamine tolerance issues um, outside the gut and at a cellular level, and there are certain genes that are responsible for that. And there's a whole list of them. You know, there's the HMNP gene, the MAOO gene. Um, those genes are responsible for breaking down histamine inside our cells. Um, and, and the thing is, is when you talk about methyl donors and things of that nature, is um, that's where that MTHFR component kind of ties back into that because the breakdown of histamine is dependent on methylation activity because you need SAME production, which is basically MTHFR, B12, that whole process of methylation. The whole goal of that is to produce SAME and our body, all right, to break histamine down needs SAME and needs methylation activity. And so if you're talking about our body's in overdrive, right? So if we've got this huge histamine burden and our body's in overdrive trying to clear histamine all the time, and we're actually just burning through our methyl donors. We're burning through CME. We're burning through all the nutrients from a B vitamin standpoint, whether you're supplement with it or dietary standpoint. We're just burning through that stuff to control the histamine burden. Now what happens is we start doing things at the gut level or systemically that starts changing the amount of histamine our body's producing in the first place. Now what happens is your body's not burning through those methyl donors. Your body's not burning through those th that methylation process as fast. So now you have that excess. And let's say somebody has other genetic components, then now they're predisposed for things like anxiety or insomnia issues or some type of like overstimulant-based symptoms. And they didn't experience that basically just based because they were had nothing left in the tank because everything was being used to control that histamine burn. Okay. So now what do you do? Do you go down another rabbit hole and investigate that? My response there is, is I usually have people start loosening the reins on the histamine side of things. Start adding some histamine components back into the mix to create that balance because it's all about balance, okay? And so if we're, if we're doing something, we're low histamine, so strict, and it's depleting things, you know, eventually that may catch up with us. So then what we do is we start adding things back in. And I use this analogy with my patients all the time, especially when we talk about, you know, components like histamine. If we think of like a bucket of water, right? And that bucket of water, the water in the bucket's histamine. And if we're at this point right now, starting out, where we're putting more water in, faster than we're taking the water out, the water's gonna spill over the edge onto the floor and we're symptomatic. So if I'm putting, if I'm putting like a, a cup full of water in every hour, but I'm only taking a thimble of water out, eventually that water level is gonna rise and spill over, right? And so if somebody's got these GI histamine issues, they got the ABP1 variants and they're doing a high histamine based diet, they're just putting a whole bunch of water in the bucket and taking very little out and there's water spilling onto the floor and they got a mess and now their body's trying to come in and mop up that mess. Uh, so what happens is now we change that story. We go in a low histamine diet. We take those AB or we take the DAO enzymes and now what we're doing is we're putting a teaspoon in and we're taking maybe three or four teaspoons out. So what's happened now is over time the water level is getting below the edge, all right, and now we got to the point where that water level is about halfway there's no more water spilling over the edge onto the floor so symptomatically feel better but now what happens is like you said 
there's more nutrients, there's more biochemistry available to do other things. And now we start noticing that we develop a whole different set of symptoms or different components because now there's a new priority to the mix. So what I usually have patients do is start playing around with the water levels. Like, okay, we increase the dietary aspects, we decrease the amount of DAO, we notice that the water level rises, and but we kind of play with it where water levels are up and down through the course of the day, but we never do it where they deplete all the way or we never do it where it spills over the edge onto the floor again. So we're kind of always working to this thing where we have balance of putting water in, putting water out, but we're not spilling over the edge or we're basically not kind of drying that bucket out. So we have other issues further downstream. And so usually when I do low histamine diets with patients, it's something that's maybe not forever. They have to be aware of it forever. But the thing is usually after a couple of weeks, couple of months, they can start loosening the reins where they can start taking some of those high histamine foods and add them back in on a rotational basis. They can start reducing the amount of ABP1 um, or, or the DAO enzymes they're taking because they've depleted those levels. They've created such a balance now. They've got that water level down that they can loosen the reins. And then when we start doing that, guess what? Now you start sucking up a little of those methyl donors that are maybe driving the anxiety or insomnia elsewhere. And so now you're creating a better balance in the body. And so a lot of times when you start noticing that, it's maybe the body's way of telling you, hey, I've done a good job at this. Let's go ahead and loosen the reins. Give me some more nutrient content here. Let me kind of suck up some of that stuff to control the histamine burden because the body's genetically predisposed. So it's kind of kind of feeding for that biochemical process to happen. And that's usually my telltale to say, all right, let's kind of loosen the reins and see how you do. Awesome. Awesome information. I mean, really it is because it comes like you've always taught me, John, in terms of that really epitomizes living under the bell shaped curve and realizing, you know, too little of something is also a problem with too much of something too. Um, but, you know, it really gets into the idea of what we're coming up with is your genetic type, because very seldom is someone going to be a pure, you know, breed of one genetic type, right? So if they have um, a high histamine type and chances are they're going to be a toxic accumulator or they're going to be an overstimulator, um, then what's going to happen is you're going to expose the other genetic type when you get a handle of the too little of the histamine. And that's where we don't want to intimidate you, but that's where that next level of healing comes in, right? I mean, that's where we see um, now do I not only have GI um, um, calmness, um, but now that overstimulating um, or toxic feeling that I have, I can go after that too. So maybe just give us a little prelude to that. Yeah, so, you know, this whole genetic type that we've been talking about, people are watching this or probably watching our, our genetic type, uh, you know, Facebook or YouTube or some other things, we're kind of sharing that. Um, you know, the thing is, is we, you know, looking at these genetic reports over the years um, and just doing what we do in practice and, and, and just trying to make it simplistic for people so that they have a better understanding, a better understanding where to start. And so this is something that we've kind of been putting together um, and with what we do with this MTH of a crash course back in the spring, this kind of your genetic type evolved and just, it's something that just light bulb went off saying, Hey, this is something with my patients. I'm, I'm been clustered them into these categories. And so with that, we've, we've developed these kind of seven core genetic types that, that everybody's going to fall into. You're going to fall into one of the seven at least. Okay. Especially if you've got chronic health issues, even if you don't, you're probably just doing the right things for it or that switch just you know, genetically never turned on. But to kind of add to your point is in a perfect world, um, it would be awesome if, if everybody just fell into like one genetic type, like everybody's just got one blood type, you know? Um, but the thing is, is genetically, there's a whole lot of genes, you know, we're talking about thousands of genes. <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of people can fall into one, two, or maybe three of these seven genetic types. And the people that we work with have a lot going on, have a laundry list of symptoms. And they're just, the needle's not budging and just they, they've done anything and everything and just they know that there's a genetic component and they're starting to kind of maybe get things turned in the right direction. The genetic type aspect really helps solidify it. And like I said, it's something where people typically are going to fall into like two or three of these. And let's say they are histamine type and they address that, but then now these other symptoms are there. Well, that just indicates that, hey, maybe they're an overstimulated type as well and they got to do some things here. But the thing is, is if you figure out what genetic type you are or what genetic types you are and you put your focus there, it really streamlines the process. It really kind of, you know, helps you connect the dots and it takes away a lot of the noise, a lot of the fluff that's out there because this genetic stuff is complicated. 
You know, it, people all the time in my office are like, I have this, I have that. It's like, well, that's not relevant because of your symptoms or testing that we know. You fall more into this and we kind of really streamline the focus and we kind of really try to make it as simplistic as possible. And when we do that, they kind of really understand and the lifestyle changes can happen, you know, and, and be more compliant with that. And we see the needle move a lot faster and, and a lot quicker um, and have bigger impacts. And we're able to really kind of categorize this down and put the focus into one, two or three of these stories rather than kind of just trying to address this whole genetic picture at the same time. Yeah, and so, I mean, the tools that we have, which are, are, are right around the corner is, being able to go to yourgenetictype.com and do our free uh, mini course that goes over what your genetic type is. So each mini course goes over or mini video goes over what, what it makes up the seven different types. And, and now you can start identifying which ones you are. Um, also a questionnaire is in development to be able to take the questionnaire and it will score it for you so you'll know what your genetic types are. And then maybe just give us a little, uh, a little sneak preview on um, a genetic type unlocked course um, that's, that really puts the puzzle pieces together for people. Yeah, so what we're, you know, we're offering a couple of things where people can kind of get an understanding of uh, how to categorize what their genetic type is, you know, and we talked, I think, a, a week ago or two about, you know, one of the biggest things can really kind of lead you down that rabbit hole initially is based on symptoms, you know, based on your health history that's going on currently or health history that's been lifelong, that can really, out of the gate, narrow down the rabbit holes and kind of start steering you down, hey, which one of these seven genetic types you are? Um, and then basically what we did is like put this mini course together that kind of explains that, that really help hold your hand to help you determine what genetic type you are. And we're putting together right now, um, and as soon as this is completed, we're going to launch everything, um, you know, and, and make that site live and everything else. And we're putting together this genetics unlocked course. And basically what that is, is it's, it's, a, it's a course that once you determine your genetic type, it's going to walk you through point A to point Z. It's going gonna, it's gonna to list out, these are the genes to put the focus on. These are the tests that maybe you should really strongly consider looking at based on your genetic type. And then more importantly, this is what you should do about it. This is the dietary lifestyle that you should follow. These are the supplement or herbals or nutrient components that you really should start considering layering into the mix and pulsing up and down because that is going to have the biggest impact in getting that needle going in the right direction. So the genetics unlock course is great because it takes that your genetic type concept and narrows it down into which one or two genetic types you are. And that unlock course is basically going to tell you, hey, now this is what you do about it going forward to start getting your health back, as well as these are the things you should consider doing the rest of your life because this is based on genetics and your genetics are not going to change. If you're a histamine type now, you're still going to be a histamine type 10 years from now. It's basically how are you controlling that histamine burden, which is, is, is the biggest factor for the rest of your life. Yeah, I mean, how are you living under that bell-shaped curve right. and being able to factor in your daily stressors, your work, your demands, your deadlines, all the, the daily tasks that you have and know and have power and autonomy over um, what you can do to support that perfect storm of genetics and epigenetics so that you are really at the peak of that curve. So awesome stuff, John. Great, great, great information. Um, any, any other pearls of wisdom that you want to drop through the whole time that you dropped here is awesome stuff. No, I, you know, I think that's a great summary. You know, I don't want information to overload for everybody, but the thing is, is, you know, understand that, you know, there's still answers. And even if you've had genetics done, or if you hadn't had genetics done, you know, this genetic type concept, um, you know, is something that I think is going to be such a game changer for a lot of people. And, you know, um, this is something that we've been working on, you know, put a lot of time, a lot of effort in. Um, and just and if, you, if you're not following us on Facebook or, or subscribe to our YouTube channel, do that because you want, you're going to want to kind of be um, in the loop that when this launches, that you're able to jump on this and start kind of learning what this genetic type is all about. So you can determine what your genetic type is so that you can start getting your health back, get that needle, you know, going in the right direction um, towards that recovery process. 
Yeah, and you know, again, once again, I mean, if you are ahead of the game and you already know about histamine, then you're really, really close. Um, the other thing we would say is if you are not so sure about histamine, but you know about MTHFR, you too are close as well because it just goes so much deeper than MTHFR. And if you know that there's something else that's missing, um, you know that you've been to your doctor and you just don't accept the fact that everything looks fine or that you should be on you know, antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications, or you should be on thyroid meds, or you should be on pain relief medications. All of those can be good stop gaps, but if you inherently know and feel that there's something else out there that you're missing that no one's telling you about, this is where the genetic component always comes into play because you can see where, I mean, it's a user guide. You can yeah. see where the weak links in the chain are, what, like you said, John, what rocks to look under so that you can really put together a customized, I mean, a fully customized game plan where it's not a cookie cutter uh, approach where you're just saying, okay, everyone who, you know, has a problem should go gluten free and that's it. That's all. Or, you know, um, if you have um, a thyroid problem, you should take thyroid meds and that's it. That's all, you know, inherently that something's driving the bus, something's causing the stress overload in the body, some kind of inflammatory response in the body. And how do I fix that based on my genetic type? And what do I do about it? So awesome yeah. stuff, John. I think it's really, like you said, it's going to be a game changer, not for, I think, hopefully for the paradigm of healthcare, because um, this is where we're headed. People are taking control of their health. They're doing the research on the internet and they're looking for a companion guide um, and the support that they need so that they can do the work, but then they can get the guidance on, on how to make the tweaks specifically for themselves. And we're going to give you every opportunity to start off as little as you want or be fully involved and have the guidance at a one-to-one at a -one level. So um, that's all we got for today. Next week, we'll have I already got our topic plan, John. Um, maybe give them a little hint on um, iron, the whole iron story iron deficiency, iron overload, um, what impact does iron play on mitochondrial health, on um, microbiome issues, what's the genetic component there, and what does my genetic type have to do with that? So that's what right. we're going to be talking about next week. Um, if that's okay, I mean, I, listen, you come up with some topics too. That's but great. I think that's a good, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that's good to go. And um, make sure you post your questions in the, le the link here. We can't see them. Um, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's Your Genetic Type. And also follow us on Instagram, Your Genetic Type, and also Twitter, Your Genetic Type. If we can get that uh, unlocked somehow, we've been, they put it on uh, lockdown mode for some reason. And then we'll have that um, website ready to go very, very shortly with yourgenetictype.com. I think that's it. I mean, I think uh, we look forward to just giving you the tools to make your health at the highest level that you can possibly make it.